Hi, I'm John. This is my show, An American Scheme, where I'm proving that Diana Ross is Michael Jackson's actual mother. So this is going to be a clip I'm going to show you that is the ending of Motown 25. And uh, right at the end, the Supremes were doing a little reunion, and then Diana Ross starts inviting everybody up on stage. And so there's, uh, just a, there's actually a few things here that are kind of interesting. So for one thing, you get to see Michael and Smokey and Diana right there, like, it, on the stage, you know, which is kind of, it's inter it's not kind of, it is interesting, you know. And then the other thing that I want you to notice is the way that everybody that comes up and hugs and kisses Diana, you'll see the way they kiss her and hug her like a man and a woman would. And then look at when Michael comes up, it's it's the way Michael hugs her and like, and Michael hugs Barry Gordy, like if there's a different thing the way he's hugging them and you can see that like in the way he hugs Barry Gordy is similar to the way he's hugging Diana it's and it's not like how all the other men are hugging and kissing Diana because you can see there's much more of a sensual affection going on with all of the other men and then uh oh yeah the other thing is that she actually, when she's introducing all the people, she introduces Michael Jackson, you know, but, but this is Motown 25, so she should have introduced the Jacksons and, and Michael, you know, or something, but she, she should have introduced them as the Jacksons. For her not to introduce as, as the Jacksons, but just to specifically say, Michael Jackson, I, I think that's like one of these little these these little subtle things. It's like okay, isn't that disrespectful to the Jacksons for the, her to just highlight Michael? You know, it's one of these things. That all these things, and it's like right here in this little thing of what's going on. There's just a lot of little things that, um, you know, look at it from the point of view that. You know, and remember, Michael saying Billie Jean here, what this all is, the song they're singing, Someday We'll Be Together, and then here they are at Motown 25, you know, it's like we've all made it, look at all, you know, it's just a really, this this moment captures, like, there's so much of what this moment captures, and that's the other thing, too, like, when you see the way Michael hugs Barry Gordy, like I, when, if you hear me talking about Billie Jean, that this performance of Michael performing uh, Billie Jean at this event, um, I, I would put that to saying like, that's a, like his Michael, Michelangelo, or I, I was saying um, like Leonardo da Vinci. And, uh, but when I go to Michelangelo, that would be like the Sistine Chapel. If I want to say Michelangelo, that would be like painting the Sistine Chapel. Same, same reference, same type of thing. And, uh, but that's what I talk about Michael's performance here at Motown 25. And so when he hugs Barry Gordy, it's like he hugs him because he's like, thank you for letting me do that. Because he knows what he just did. He did Billie Jean with the performance at Motown 25. He knew what that was, what, what that was going to do. And it did it. What happened? It turned him into the biggest star in the world. And when he hugs Barry Gordy, you know, of everything, of the understanding. And it's kind of like Terrell like the way he hugs Barry Gordy too. It's kind of like, he's kind of like saying, kind of like, thanks. You know, I, I, I get it. We get, you know, it's, it's, this is it really, it's just weird what's going on here. See, so the way he comes up and he kisses her on the cheek and stuff, and but you can tell that they're they're close. And I, you know, we've seen other stuff with them kissing and stuff. Kisses on the lips at first and then hugs, because that's one of the guys with Temptations. He's probably known her since their primes and the primettes. Kiss on the lips, that's Richard Pryor. You know, before they come, see all it is with her though? It's more like a sensual. She hugs men and kisses men, and all of them. It's the way it is with her. That's the way she is. You know, think about how they've what they've all come through. Michael, and now she she introduces Michael, not the Jacksons, and now he kisses her totally on the cheek and hugs her like a, my mother, not my lover. You know, Billie Jean is not my uh, lover. But see the way they hug. And now look at that, Michael and Smokey, classic.
Like, that's what I'm saying. While he's in his Billy Jean, like, stuff, after he just did that, that's, uh... It's like a moment in time and stuff. When you look back on it now, and you see the reality, when you know that those are his parents and everything that have, has occurred right here. You know, there's just, one, like I always say, there's so much more. You know, you can see Michael's shirt sparkling right next to Diana's when they're up there on the stage like that. That's kind of cool how you could see this. You can see those sparkly shirts and see that they're right next to each other. So you can always spot Michael because it's a sparkly shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now she's calling Barry Gordy down. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry Gordy. You know, the reality of where these people, what they've all achieved, you know? And when you hear my story of what was going on, with her and Barry and, and Smokey and how all that happened. See, kiss on lips, but they were like, they had kids, so for them to kiss on lips, but of course they're good. But look at how Michael hugs him. See, it's like, thanks. Like, you made the, you did it. You did all this, thank you. And he let him do his Billie Jean performance and hug Smokey. There's the family. That's what Motown's about right there. Diana, Barry, and Smokey. They're the ones because of all of what they did. And then because of that was the Michael Jackson thing that came out of all of that. And and then you see them together, like right here. It's like a perfect example of, uh, you know, and someday we'll be together, you know. It's like this moment in time. It's, it's good. It's one of those moments, times. It's like, but see, this is like, um... With Michael, this is why you gotta understand that they did this, but then Michael did Dirty Diana. See, this is like, we'll be together, and there they are. Like, you know, so there they all are, you know? Oh, what, like, what a joyous occasion and moment, you know? Like, that's a real, like, what a moment in history and stuff, you know? But what happens after this? On Michael's next album, he's calling Diana Ross Dirty Diana and telling the story. And like what the people think of what it is, the size, no, it's, that's the story of Diana Ross and Smokey and the Claudette and that's kind of stuff and stuff. But what he's actually singing about is he's singing about his parents' relationship. He's, you know, that's what it's about. It's not, and then Diana's the groupie to Smokey. That's why the people say it's supposed to be about a groupie and stuff. Yeah, it's Diana's the groupie to Smokey because she was just 14 years old when Smokey was just starting to hook up with uh, Barry Gordy. And she was like the little groupie right there. And then she did what she did. She gave her kid away. And then what does she do? She just like full on goes right back. She's like going to Motown. She's doing everything she can to get, she's on, you know, on a, on a direct course, making sure she gets back there. She gets in there. She hooks up with Barry Gordy. Just all this stuff of like her, she had the mission. She was on a mission. And then what happens uh, with her is like the things is uh, with the Jacksons. As soon as there is the opportunity, is it's like as soon as the opportunity, the real opportunity for the Jacksons to come in, boom, they come back to Motown because Michael. And like he, Michael's the different because you can see like she didn't introduce the Jacksons, you know? She should have introduced, like when she was saying the Temptations, and then she was saying Four Tops, she was introduced in different groups there and stuff. And uh, she should have introduced the Jacksons, right? That's the way, that's the Motown band. The Motown band's the Jackson Five. She should have said the Jackson Five, you know? She should have introduced, but no, Michael Jackson, the one. He's the one, the separate one. There's always this different thing about him you know, and their relationship, and then you could see them in which the way he came up and hugged her, and the way that he hugged and embraces Barry Gordy, you could see that it's not, there's nothing sexual whatsoever. The exact same real embrace that he gave to Barry Gordy, that's the same exact way he gave the embrace to Diana Ross. There was no sexual thing, there was always, it's something else, completely something else, and those hugs show it because the hug he gave to Diana was just like what he had done to Barry Gordy. But the, everybody else that was hugging Diana was hugging her like, you know, it's Diana Ross, you know? And she's given them the little kiss because she's Diana Ross and she loves to kiss everybody. She does her little flirty thing. That's the way she is. That's the way she always was, you know? <sighs> 
That's why I was saying. Just it's just these things, you know. When when I see these things, it's just like, ugh. you know, I just see so much, and it it just makes me like it's these things about with Michael Jackson. That's like, you know, that uh, his his story needs to be told. His real story. That it. There's, no, you know, with all the stuff and everything out there and you have the so many stories of Michael Jackson and everybody's life, it affects it so many, you know, but now there is the real story. There is an actual real story that explains everything. And it's it's been right there in front of our face, all of us, as they say, hiding in plain sight. You couldn't hide it any better than to hide it in plain sight and just flaunt it to everybody because it was just so plain. Nobody... Nobody was seeing it because the connection to Michael and the Jacksons was so strong. It was so heavy. <laughs> and I just want, I want to see what happens when society comes around and has to deal with the reality of what was done. And then now this is the reality of the truth is coming out. This is one of the best things about this story. Like I hear people talk about all the things about what they talk about all throughout history and stuff. You know, I, I was uh, trying to have talks with, uh, I don't know <laughs> in which way to refer to them. Uh, those, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> I was talking to some people. <laughs> and uh, so one of the main things is like, I talk to a lot of people that have a lot of interest in history and culture and the past and stuff, right? And they're always, okay, let's just talk about, they talk about Jesus and they talk about all this stuff, you know, everything. And they always talk about him like real factual, no, like he was this way. No, he didn't do that. No, no, this is what happened. This is what they happened. And it's like, they talk about all that stuff in the past with such passion and f like it's such actual factual accuracy everything the way they speak about it like no this is exactly and it's like look at calm down on all that shit because look at my story is right here and it's right now we all lived through Michael Jackson's life but all of the other players of the main players who are involved in what I'm talking about they're all alive we can actually get this to come out and have this truth and have the explanation and it can happen to us as a society as a whole and what it's going to do i know it's going to be it's one of these things that like where i'm at and i know how big it is and stuff but i can't even grasp of what's actually going to happen and how it's actually going to affect and the things of what's going to happen no, I mean, I know it's going to be big and I know things are going to happen, but when it happens, I, I don't know, it, but I know it's going to be big. And this is right here. This is, this is the most, what more of a perfect example can you ask to show people that Michael Jackson's entire life, he lived it as a lie in the public's right in their face and nobody ever knew he went to his deathbed with the lie. That's the thing that it's just like, that's the part where it's like, oh, that's why I get mad at the fans for like all the past stuff where I yelled at the fans because I had to, I was the one, you guys are going to do it after, after you all see the truth and you have to see what happens, that you're going to have to get to that point where you're going to say, oh, oh man, he had to hold that truth and then he died the junkie that way. Oh, and it's like, oh, oh man. That's what happened. And see, it's like, and I got it. I got a freaking, I'm holding this shit. Well, oh, no, you people just playing all your freaking games, you know. And I'm sitting here dealing with that. Like, oh, that's, and then, oh, that's what happened. That's what, oh, man. And then now it's like I'm trying to come out here and help clear his name. And the stuff of what I deal with this attack and the way people treat me and stuff and. One of the ways in what happens, and uh, it's just really funny. Every single person attacks me. They sit up there and they talk about how in the world, like everything's wrong. And they know what's right. And they always ask the questions. How could you do this? How could you do that? But every single one of those people does all of that shit to me. And they somehow justify it to themselves through what have I actually done? What, have I, what did I actually do? What did I, you know? Because I'm in here telling stories and shit. 
having encounters with people and for some reason that that has justified them to do everything in which they think is negative what they claim to be wrong in the world and they say and you need to stop that why do people do that they literally do it to me every single thing that they talk about and I just sit there in awe I watch these videos by these people and they sit here condemning this you know saying why do you do this how do you speak this way how do you do that and I literally just sit there and I'm like that's what you did to me you did and with with no evidence of of your accusations of the people what they make the accusations that they make against me no evidence against that just Flat out, oh, you're crazy. I mean, it's every, I can't even get into it because it's, it's literally everything. Everything. I can't even, there's nothing that has not been said to me, accused of me, people doing all this stuff and massive attacks of it, levels of it. And it's just like, and I just sit back and it's just like, I could care less about their stupid petty attacks because to me it's like, you know, it's just kids, stupid kids. It's like, it's like, funny. it's like, it's like if you were, it's like, I remember being younger, you know, being young, probably ditching school. <laughs> and then I remember walking by an elementary school one time and the kids were out there in the field, but they're on the other side of the fence and shit. And they start yelling at me and shit. They think they're all tough and shit. But that, that's how it is. When they're on the other side of the fence, yeah, they'll yell at you. Everybody yells at you. Everybody yells at you and stuff. It's like, so what, you know? It's just kids yelling at you. I mean, it's just kind of funny and shit, right? So that's how it is in YouTube. Even if they're old people or whatever, the big, strong, tough people. To me, it's just like, it's like the same thing. Like those kids on the other side of the fence yelling at me. It's just like, oh, that's funny. That's kind of hilarious and shit. But that's just what they do. Kids kids are kids and shit. Stupid people are stupid people. And the main problem in everybody's life is they're... That's what everybody with all the complaints and everybody... Everything about everything. What's, every, what's the real problem in everybody's life and what are the problems in the world? Like you could ask... I could ask you that. What's the actual real problem in everybody's life? And if I said, what's the actual real problem in the world? Like... What would come out like, I mean, it can it'd be never ending ex examples and expressions. People be given their opinions and everything. Right. But it's like, nah, you guys can. And I, I was like, man, as I was say, you guys just argue semantics. It's like it's stupid stuff. You guys are pointless. It's ridiculous. All your conversations to me, it's ridiculous stuff because understanding what's wrong with people in life and, and, and how, what's wrong with the world is really, really simple. Okay, first of all, if you want to say what's wrong with the world, it's like, oh, okay, well, we die. <laughs> we live, we die. And then when you want to talk about the harsh reality of it, it's like there's a lion and they stalk their prey and they freaking attack it and then they eat that fucker. And it's like, that's kind of really more what's going on with the people, too. There's a lot of that really, really nasty stalking and, and eating and devouring of your of your uh, enemies and, the, you know, the victims. And it's just weird stuff like that. <clears throat> so that's what's wrong with the world is that, you know, we die and we eat we feed on other living creatures and beings and then they'll feed on us, too. You know, so that's actually what's wrong with the world. Now, what's wrong with an individual? What's wrong with an individual is that we know we die. <laughs> we know we die. And we know that we can die in all kinds of weird, messed up ways, like all kinds of shit. And then when you die, you're dead. The world goes on. That's the thing about what's wrong with us as people is that we all know that when we die, it, not everybody else didn't die. Most likely, you know, that's the most likely what's going to happen. Most likely you're going to die, but everybody else can still be here. <laughs> and so <clears throat> everybody's just like scared to hell about dying because the reality of dying, they don't believe in God. It's simply, they all talk about what God is and they know so much. It's like, do you think when you die, let's say like, and then those people all think it, there's going to be a form of a judgment that takes place. That's most of them would think that something like that's going to occur. And it's like, okay, so, okay, let's say you die and you go meet uh, God and you think God's going to say, was Jesus a black man or a white man? And then if you say, Jesus was a white man, he's going to say, wrong to hell with you. Damn you for eternity burning hellfire. Ha! <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, the questions is like, the knowledge of what people argue, and it's like, dude, okay, do you think that that's what God's going to ask you? Do you think that, how important is that? What kind of question is that in our world to be worthy of knowing? Okay, it's cool. You want to have, do your little things? Cool. But they act like that, that's everything, having that knowledge and that information. Oh, they're so good. They got all that stuff. And it's like, dude, <laughs> yeah, when God asks you the question, what you, you know, they, they, oh, they want to debate. They're going to win the debate. And it's like, you're going to go debate God? <laughs> And that's the way I see their conversations taking place. It's like, they're trying to debate God. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's actually what they think they're doing. <laughs> I, just I just picture it in my head. It's like, you know, I, I picture you die and, you know, you go and you're <laughs> being judged by God and you're going to start debating him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somehow in their heads they're going to be like he sends you to hell and you would be like damn him he must have been the, the white man's god that was the white man's god he didn't like what he didn't like my truce he couldn't handle he couldn't handle the smoke he didn't like the smoke he sent me to hell Oh, man. Oh, shit. So that's what's like with all the things in people's life. It's like, it's like, it's like, oh, you would say like, oh, I fed, I fed hungry people. But did you really feed hungry people? Did, did you really give from yourself and feed hungry people? Some people do. Some people really do. Like they go out and work and then on the weekends, they go out and work for free and give their money away. <laughs> some people do that stuff, you know? And some people do it because they actually enjoy helping other people, just that joy. But some people do it because they think what they call is like buying, what's known as buying a stairway to heaven. And if you do that, like that's what I'm saying, you could be that kind of person where you go to work, you make your money on the weekends, you work for free and you take as much of your money as you can and help donate it to people in need and stuff, right? You would think in your mind that there's no way that that person's doing wrong, but there is. Some of those people are just doing, buying a stairway to heaven and in their head, they actually are doing it because they think that they're getting, gaining favor, favor from God. And if you do it for that reason, it's wrong. And then you're that person's wrong. It's not going to be proper. You know, what, you, what you're going to have in real life is what you'll experience if you, is that kind of person. <clears throat> Out of 10 people that are that way, that uh, they work, then they go to the weekend and then they work for free and actually donate their own money and, and help other people. Out of every 10 of those people, I would say from my experience, I would say that one of them. One of them's actually the real one that's good. The other nine, what you're probably getting is probably 50-50. You're getting half of them are buying a stairway to heaven, and the other half of them are just looking to abuse victim. They're trying to uh, gain uh, people's trust, you know, by getting people to think, oh, they're good. And then they do that to look for vulnerabilities, wait for people. They gain their trust, so people will, uh, they'll look for the vulnerabilities, and that's how people look to, uh, like, like predators and stuff, the pedophiles. And so that's what I'd say is like, yeah, so out of those 10 people that are really the ones that, and so out of those 10 people, how many of you people are qualified to pick out the one that's the good one? This is what I'm saying in the world, actual like skills and abilities and stuff. I think that I have the ability to look at those 10 people. If I had a conversation with them, I'd be able to pick out the one that's actually the real, the angel, the good one. And then I'd, I'd probably be able to separate the other ones and be able to tell you, okay, now this one's the faker who's buying the stairway to heaven. And I'd be able to say, this one's the perfect, this is the guy we need to get out of here. You can just go up to them and ask them questions and see their responses and the way that I could read their emotions and everything. And I could see their responses to the questions in which I would be asking them because it's not questions in which they would be expecting to be asked. And then in which they, the, in which the way they deal with that, I would easily be able to see, well, who this is who they actually are so I could just pick those people apart you know 
And it's like, I actually have that skill. I have that ability. I wasn't, I didn't go to school to learn it or whatever. It's, I don't know, but I, I've got it. I know for sure as hell is I've got that ability. So <clears throat> it's one of these things about, and then because of that, the reason I have the ability is because I believe in God and I know I'm going to die. I can't say that I'm not afraid of dying because there's a good chance that you're going to experience some kind of pain when you die. You know, there's going to be probably some kind of pain that goes where you know, shit, I'm dying and shit, you know? <laughs> you know, most likely you will experience, and at that moment, it's like, oh, I'm gone. I, I'm, I'm gone from here. And everybody, like I said, that's that moment where you say, oh, I'm gone, and everybody else is still here. You know, and then in that second, you you have to deal with that reality. I'm I'm oh, I'm gone. They're here. I'm I'm gone. Now we're in different. You know, that's a weird reality that you have to deal with in that instant. You know, like oh shit, I'm out of here, and they're they're all still here. I'm I'm gone now. I'm dead. I'm dying. You know, so and with that, you could be dealing with. You could be dying because freaking who knows all the pain and all the shit of what you're going through, what could be happening. That's what that's what's uh. Dying's scary. Living to be old, like, look at, I'm getting to be old enough now where, look at, there's one of the things that I realized recently in my life, and, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this is what, this is like, this is crazy shit, okay. When I was young, you would hear about people, they would talk about, like, men. They would say, oh, men, when they get to be 50, they have a midlife crisis, and they start buying Porsches, and they start dating younger women and stuff like that, right? And they would call it a midlife crisis, okay? So I'm 47 years old now. So what happened, why the crisis thing happened, I've ha now I've seen this. I understand. But what, what happened was they were putting it on the context that you got to be 50 and you realize that half of your life is gone. That's the way that they would kind of put it. But I'm 47 and I can clearly look around and see which in way the life I've led, led that for me to live to be 70 would be, that's like, shoot, if I can get to be 70, I'm going to be like, damn, I got to be seven. I'd be shocked, okay? So 47 plus 23 would be 70, okay? So 23 and 23 is 46, okay? So what that means is I'm 47. So what that means is I haven't lived a half of my life. I've already lived two thirds of my life. I only have a third of it left if I'm lucky. Okay, that's what a midlife crisis is. That's when you realize, oh shit, I'm not like halfway through my life. I'm two thirds through my life, you know? And then what's coming, this is the downside shit we're gonna deal with probably all your fucking teeth fall out and then maybe you get cancer and they fucking start shooting you with fucking radiation and chemotherapy treatment and like that's what you got to do and then who knows and then then you got to watch um, all your friends die all your family die this is what you got to look forward to and then now what's happening these disgusting people are yelling at the old people because They've lived their life and they have some money. And so they're yelling at them because they've got money. And, uh, and then they've lived their life. So, of course, they've got opinions about things. They've lived long lives. They've seen all kinds of things. Of course, they got opinions. But because of those things now, the youth is all frustrated with the elderly people. And they're actually starting to attack. They're starting to verbally attack the elderly people of this nation. And the reason because they got a lot of money. And that's really what's going on. Nobody wants to talk about none of that shit, you know. It's all about this thing called the baby boomer generation. And that's why there's this actual term out right now degrading them, saying, okay, boomers, or okay, boomer, whatever that thing is. It's an attack on the elderly of our uh, country. And they're doing these subtle little subverses of tax to get the younger generation to not really appreciate them and it's like what happens in a society and the things in which i see it's like if you were if you're promoting an agenda to not appreciate the elders and then you're also promoting an agenda that they've gotten a lot of money and then and then okay boomer that the, their opinions are not valid anymore and they need to get out of the way if you're starting to promote that agenda it's clearly obvious what's coming they're looking to either steal all the money from the elderly people or kill them 
or the combination. Steal all their money, then kill them off. This is, you can see like, like, you know, when all these people are yelling about Trump and they're saying all the things, and one of the things is they say, oh, the dog whistles, this is what they say. Oh, they're, he's, he's the dog whistles, the things he's saying are the dog whistles of the white power movement and the Nazi movement and all the dog whistles. That's what they say. It's like, no, the real dog whistles are what's taking place against the elderly community right now in our country. I can hear those dog whistles. Those are actually occurring. Like, for the people to think in this country that's so diverse, and first of all, like those elderly people, you know how many of those white elderly people actually went over and fought to stop Hitler? And the people, they talk about, oh, the Nazi movement and the white power. And it's like, okay, and they talk about like that's in America. And it's like, how many of the people in America were white that were killed to stop that? I guarantee that out of all of the races that Hitler killed, by far, it's not even close, the amount of white people, and I'm excluding the Jews from calling them white. I'm saying that the Jews are a different thing. Let's just call white people, other white people that are not even the Jews. The amount of the white people that were murdered in uh, World War II is far beyond what were slaughtered when the Jews were being actually executed. Like, Hitler was actually killing them, like trying to kill them intentionally. But within the process of that, he had to fight a lot of battles and stuff. And all those battles, basically every single time he's fighting white people and killing the fuck out of them too. Killing them by the millions. There's probably as many Russians, they probably lost as many Russians in World War II to the Germans as, as what you would say the entirety of the Jewish population that died. I think it's probably, probably a similar number. I would even think, if I had a bet on it, I would say that the Russians lost more. But I, I don't know exactly and stuff. But if I was, if I was to bet on that, I would, I would say, if somebody like made a bet, who lost more lives in World War II? The Russians or the Jewish population, the, the accumulative population of Jews, because they would have been from all over the place. And, uh, you know, so who would have lost more? Would have been the accumulative combination of the Jews or the Russians, you know? And so if I was betting on that, because you would think instantly, oh, that's got to be the Jews for sure. But I don't know. It might be the Russians. I don't know those numbers actually, but I know that the Russians is big. And that's just talking about the Russians. We're not talking about the French. How many French got people? How many Polish people were murdered by, you know? How many, there, there's all those countries, you know? And then, then you're talking about the English. How many English of the people from England were killed? The Brits, Brits killed by the uh, Germans. Lots of them. Bunches of white people. And then now you talk about the Americans. How many Americans did we lose in World War II? Bunches. You think about those, uh, you know, those when they stormed the beaches on Normandy and they're just mowing us down. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, that stuff happened. Those are the Germans. They're slaughtering white people. And then now in America, you have all these white people that people that part actually lived in that. <laughs> people that actually, and now they're like uh, trying to like screw the old people, you know, and, and so the kids of the those people would be the uh, the baby boomers would be the kids of those people. So those people are just getting to like the retirement age. And so all their parents, those would be like the World War Two people, you know, so all of those people that are like the real old people now that were all the people in the war. So all of their children, they came home after the war and they had children and those would be the baby boomers. And now this is the people that are under attack. And it's like, okay, so that's the people that fought to do everything. They had children and now you're attacking their children are going to be just their The attack that's coming to the baby boomers is insane. That's what all this stuff's about. How are they going to provide medical to the baby boomer generation? You know, when those people, they're not going to have enough doctors to take care of those people. Once, if, if they can't cure Alzheimer's, when Alzheimer's starts to ravage through the baby boomer generation, they're not going to have enough hospitals and people to care for them. They're like, that's what they, they know that. So what they're thinking is like, in their head, they're trying to think of, how do we put them into like a medically induced coma, basically? This is really how, when you talk about the pharmaceutical people and the medical people, and then you have all the these big, large, uh, it's like this industrial uh, medical system that cares for the elderly and all the stuff of all, it's 
big money all around, so much everywhere. And so you have all of those people. And what they want to do when they're caring for people, the whole thing is profits. They're not looking to care for people. They're looking to make profits within that. In that. All, always. There's no system there where they're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we care for these people and not charge them any money? That's not what's going on. It's always, how do we charge them and how do we maximize our profits, baby? Cha-ching, cha-ching, you know, that's what they do. That's all they care about is like seeing at the end of the bank, watching that money roll in. When they see the person, they just see money. It's like, yeah, bring them on in. They know how much money that's worth. Cha-ching, they're going to they're gonna charge them for this. They're going to charge them for that. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And then what they're doing, they basically they keep them in this medically induced coma state while they just drain them of every dollar they can, suck them dry. And then the person ends up dying because they fed them so much drugs. With the, after they sucked them dry with all their money, then the drugs that they've been giving them will kill them off in, in just a matter of a few years. And then everybody's kind of like happy and shit. And that's what's like, that's their way of taking care of these people. That's what they're going to do. That's what's coming. That's what, you know, and so all of that stuff, like when you, peop, when you hear people saying things like uh, that, the one that they're saying, the OK Boomer, when you're saying that, what you're saying is, what you're actually saying is you think it's okay to rob from a person once once they get elderly and they're not capable of defending themselves anymore. What you're saying is at that point you think it's fine to rob all of their money because they're not able to defend themselves anymore. And what do they need their money for? Because now they're in a hospital. And that's like, and then they're vulnerable. This is like how it, what happens in our society. There's all kinds of people that get to be vulnerable and all kinds of reasons and stuff like that. They're vulnerable. And then what happens to vulnerable people? You have predators, you know, feeding off of those people. And when a person is vulnerable and you have predators that have learned how to feed off of that person for an amount of time, and then they, then the person dies off, and then they get another one. And they learn how to suck them dry. They're you know like vampires. They're feeding off the people's blood and their pains, and and this is what we allow to happen in our society. <laughs> how did I get into this conversation? <laughs> That's a conversation. So they go crazy place. So yeah, I was talking about how good people and stuff like that. But that's what I'm saying. Like people who are actually uh, for. Ramble on so much long, we only ran a couple more minutes. Let me say one thing really quick. Um, there's this guy, he's, I, I was making videos on him called uh, Cynetta. He has his Cynetta Studios, and then he has this other page called um, Black News 102. And so <clears throat> you have to watch the people to actually hear what they are to figure out the stuff before I can give a good uh, judgment of who these people are. And so the stuff they always say, uh, he, he always, always starts off, he would say like peace and black power family. He would always start off like that. And he has his black power sign. And then he's definitely nation of Islam too and stuff. And so when they talk about black power, I told, that does not offend me whatsoever. When you talk about say black power, black power, you know, support the black power, black first. That does not offend me at all and not only does it not offend me I would actually support you on that yeah I support that yeah no you got the right to go black power yeah you need to be telling your people we need our own businesses we need to support our communities because we've been getting screwed over and we've learned from the what you see with all of the other people is that when they support their own communities it brings up the whole community as a whole it's good for all of you yeah I'd be like yeah you need to be telling the people all that stuff. Yeah, I, all of that stuff. But as soon as you say, once, once you say you're anti-white man, ah, oh, dude, you just ruined the whole thing. The whole fucking thing. Like, dude, I don't care about you whatsoever anymore at all, dude. Nothing. You're nothing to me. You're, I would have supported your black power. I would help you. I want you to do that. As soon as you say, now, like I said, you do the black man first. That's fine. But once you say, I will not help the white man, we are anti-white man, down with the white man. Screw you, Sinetta. You're a fraud. God does not fucking protect you because you're fucking working for the devil. If you want to you see the devil, go look at your brother polite. That guy's actually the devil. 
That's actually what the devil is. What kind of actual good man could have all of those women and be bringing them to himself? That's like the lowest form of scumbag that he could do. Only a devil would do that. An actual devil. Polite is actually living his life. He's chosen to live as what it means to be the devil. That's what we're actually here on earth. To actually have the choice. You can live as a, as a god or you can live as a devil. Or you can live as a slave. It's actually three choices. You know, Or you can be victim. You can be anything here on this earth. You're going to go through all kinds of stuff. But there's actually people because they go to their nature of what they want to be. And this is how people get isolated from heaven. It's not that they go to hell. They choose to isolate themselves because they want all everything for themselves. And then they want to dominate over the other people. That brother polite can any be for, cannot be any form of a godly human being because he enslaves women and he dominates them. He makes them a lesser. He makes them lesser than him. He does not bring them as an equal. He makes them as a lesser human being. That's not what women are here to do. Women are not here to be human, lesser human beings. They are here to be different, but they are more than qualified to be justified as an equal they're freaking they get birth and not only do they get justified to be equal if somebody's gonna say that they're greater the women have the right they're the ones giving birth we sure as hell don't do none of that you know that's the thing about in the world is that there's no doubt about it that women are stronger than men men are smarter than women that's how it works because the women always say where they think they're they think that they're smarter than the men. No, that is not how it works. Men the men are smarter. But the men also think that they're stronger because of just the physical thing. But no, we're not even close. The women are by far stronger. That's how it actually works. The women are the strong ones. The men are the smart ones. And but men because they have that physical advantage. They're so stupid because all people are stupid and we have to deal with these realities. That's like, that's like a simple reality of what, as a man, you have to learn, like, um, you have to learn to say to like a woman, you think I'm bigger. What do you mean? She's stronger than me. She sure as hell ain't stronger than me, <laughs> you know? But you have to look as an intellectual and say, oh no, no, she definitely stronger than me. What she has to deal with and being like being a small person in a world of a big environment and then having to allow that bigger creature to jump on you and shit, you know, and dealing with that shit. You got to be strong to allow that to walk around in that presence. So what the women have to do, it's much more scary and they got to do it. They're, they have to be strong. And then when like they, they have to actually give a baby and give birth this and remember. There wasn't freaking, not everybody had freaking good drugs available to them all throughout history. Women throughout history, they were giving birth. <laughs> they weren't getting dope. I mean, they weren't getting drugged up. That stuff, there was always been drugs around. But not on the level of like what it is now where you, if you want to get drugged up, you get drugged up and stuff. And, you know, so women gave birth. Shit, I know there's, I know there's not many men out there that are being like, oh, yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> we all are like, no, that's, that don't look like too much fun to me. <laughs> so I always get rambling on about everything because actually I want to talk about this. But like I said, that Sinetta dude, he really disappointed me because what I found out with him, that's why I'm just like, ah, screw him. Him, the Ashe Divine, who it's like, Shh. She's such a freaking moron. She's actually specifically one person I'm actually talking about who she talks down about me like I'm something. She will say like I'm, she literally, she attacked me without ever speaking to me. She she called me really low degrading things without having any knowledge of any of the real situation which is occurring. She's still doing it. She just mentioned my name again the other day. She actually said that she's attacking me. She's attacking my page and my videos. She's actually attacking me and she's promoting it to the world. Ooh, I'm attacking him. I'm getting his videos removed. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. It's like, yeah, you're real ghetto. You're real street, aren't you? Yeah, you're real genuine, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So you, that's what happened. I, so it's like even Mitch, I'm, I'm basically just done with them because what I have, what I found out is they were just such pathetic losers. They're so stupid and pathetic. And the uh, the Sineta dude, he doesn't understand that his show is there for the public. It's not him to be a controller of what's information he's controlling and allowing to go out to the public. It's not. It's a whatever his whole reason to be there is to allow any voice to come into his uh, forum and it's his job to say our forum is strong we're strong in our beliefs over here and we'll let anybody come in and try and challenge us because you're going to get dealt with that's what you want to do and, he, and then that's what the public wants to see they want to see people come in there and get dealt with but no, as soon as somebody starts speaking different, he, oh no, you ain't gonna say that on my show, brother. No, you ain't gonna say that on my show. It's like, dude, oh, what, what's your show then? If, you're, if people are not allowed to speak their minds and have uh, diverse conversations on your show, then what is your show? It's a joke. It's a fraud, it's a scam, and it has nothing to do with God. Here's another thing I wanna say about Sinetta Cy really quick. He has a daughter named Africa. And this because he thinks he's so Africa. Dude, if a big rock fell out of the sky tomorrow and killed, literally killed every single person in Africa, you probably would not even shed a tear, Sinetta. You literally probably would not even shed a tear if every single person in Africa was killed tomorrow. Oh, but if your baby was somehow in a tragic accident, your baby named Africa, who's an American, who lives in America. Now, if she was, if she was unfortunately lost her life, what kind of pain would you feel? The worst pain ever. It would hit you and you would feel it horribly. But every single human being in Africa could die tomorrow. You probably wouldn't even cry. And you got the nerve to call yourself, align yourself with Africa? when clearly all of your real love and your heart and your emotions are right here in America, you stupid fucking American.